Oh, there it is. We got it. All right. That's what I've been looking for. Well, as you can see from the title here, this is the truth about alcohol, what the Bible says about alcohol. And a lot of times, even it's becoming even more popular within different Christian denominations now to actually justify the use of alcohol. And we want to look at some of the Bible verses that people use to do so. And as a quick disclaimer, this is not meant to beat anyone over the head. Uh, my husband was just reading a chapter about repentance from steps to Christ. And Ellen White beautifully said, sometimes the drunkard is told that his sins will be, keep him out of heaven, but pride goes unrebuked in the church. And she actually said pride is even more heinous and even more odious in the eyes of God. So mm -hmm. this is not meant to like point fingers at anyone who struggles with alcohol or who may be drinking. Um, this is just meant to look at the history of alcohol, what the Bible teaches about alcohol, and especially to focus on some verses that people use to even justify drunkenness. So just in case you have these conversations with your friends, um, these will shed some light on some difficult Bible passages in regards to alcohol. Hmm. If we look at different denominations and different religions and their views on alcohol, we can see they're drastically different. In Judaism, wine is used oftentimes in rituals, but it's a small amount of wine. In fact, drunkenness is looked down on in the Jewish community. And nowadays, there's oftentimes alcohol-free alternatives that they're using during their rituals. In Islam, alcohol is strictly forbidden. Like a Muslim might do other things, but the one thing they're not going to do is drink alcohol. And this is actually a good way you could connect with someone if they're of an Islamic faith. Because as Adventists, we don't drink alcohol. So right away, there's this connection because they would rather die than drink alcohol. Mm. Thirdly, within Christianity, there's three different views on alcohol, which we will look at in a little bit. And lastly, most Buddhists also abstain from alcohol. So if you're ever talking to a Jewish individual or an Islam or a Buddhist, you now know that you can kind of connect on that issue of alcohol because Two of those denominations do not even drink. And the third one, Judaism, drinks in much smaller amounts. Mm. Tonight, we're going to look at the history of alcohol in the last 6,000 years. Um, the Bible mentions alcohol quite a bit. So we're going to look at some of those stories and passages. And then we're going to look at four particular Bible verses that are used to justify alcohol. And we're going to see, does God really say it's okay to drink alcohol and strong drink like whiskey or liquor? So we're going to see what does the context tell us? What do other verses tell us about these misunderstood Bible verses? To give you a quick history of alcohol, it's pretty much been around since the formation of the world. Right away, as soon as Noah gets off the ark, he sacrifices to God. God gives him the rainbow as a promise. Then he grows a vineyard and gets drunk. And throughout history, that seems to be a common theme. People like to get drunk. We can see this on the left-hand side. Those are some famous Greeks. They even had special wine glasses that when you laid down and you drank the wine, it wouldn't spill all over you. And hmm. they've actually excavated some of these. And my husband and I saw some of them in Athens. <laughs> very interesting. On the right-hand side, you have the Egyptians who also were very passionate about wine and beer in particular. And the Greeks, actually 300 years before Jesus, they invented a, some sort of like, it's like a robot where it would walk around the room and then you would push the button and it could either give you wine or it could give you water or it could give you a mixture of both. And what I'll do is I'll actually send you the link to that afterwards if you want to look at the engineering behind that and how popular it was. Obviously, only rich people had that type of party stunt, but it was interesting that they had that type of technology 300 years before Jesus. Mm. That's something my husband and I actually saw in this museum when we were in Greece as well. So definitely travel overseas if you can, because you'll learn a lot of cool things you never thought you'd know. <laughs> Alcohol has become increasingly popular. Um, throughout Bible times, it was drunk. Throughout medieval times, the dark ages, it was drunk. And even here in early America, we oftentimes think of the Puritans as being very religious, but they did drink a lot because they didn't always have fresh water. Beer was actually a better alternative to water because water oftentimes got slimy and things were growing in it, where supposedly the beer was a little bit safer. So even young children grew up drinking like hard cider or beer or things like that. That might have been one of the reasons why they didn't live very long and their teeth fell out at a very young age. So if you were my age and you still had your teeth, that was crazy because most people drinking at such a young age, your teeth will rot out. But around the 1830s, Americans started getting really concerned about how liquor was tearing apart the nation. 
So you might be familiar with the Second Great Awakening when people thought that Jesus was coming in 1844. So they wanted to hasten his return, and they felt that one of the things they could do was to be abolish alcohol. So they started pushing for the temperance, which was abstaining from alcohol. And as you can see right here, a lot of times people would sign these pledges. They'd get young kids in Sunday school to sign these and to promise, according to this, they would say, trusting in God's help, I solemnly promise to abstain from the use of alcoholic drinks as a beverage, including wine, beer and cider, and from the use of tobacco and opium in any form. And they would get adults and even young children to sign these pledges. Well, then, a few years later, in 1851, Maine is the first state to pass prohibition on alcohol. And then mm -hmm. they form an anti-saloon league, so people are trying to get rid of the bars and the taverns. And then, finally, it goes as far as to actually abolish alcohol. The 18th Amendment is ratified and alcohol is abolished. But there's a lot of loopholes because it doesn't exactly specify what alcohol is, so, of course, people try to get around it. So the Volstead Act is passed, and this says anything more than half a percentage of alcohol is considered alcohol or strong drink. So this lasted for about 10 years or so, and it didn't really go well. People became closet drinkers. It's very interesting that in the South, a lot of the Appalachian men, they'd have these normal looking cars, but they would modify the engine, and then they would race all over these mountain roads, and they would outrun the police. That actually led to NASCAR because after alcohol was legalized again, they still liked racing so much that NASCAR was actually officially formed in 1947. <laughs> and I'll send you a link to that after this in the email. I find that type of history to be very, very interesting. So alcohol has its ups and its downs here in American history. Unfortunately, today, within the church, there's a lot of controversy over it because some people are for the use of all spirits and all alcohol. Other people think it should be modified. And lastly, there's some such as Seventh-day Adventists that believe that the Christian should have nothing to do with it. So here for the rest of the time, we're actually just going to look at what the Bible has to say about that. Here in Everglades City, um, there were only wives in the city for a number of years, and that's because of all the bootleggers there. That's really interesting. I never knew Florida was involved that much in the bootlegging. I'm definitely going to read more about that. That's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, they sure were. Uh, all their husbands were in jail. Sorry, no comment or no. On mute. Mm -hmm. So within the church today, um, even unfortunately, sometimes in the Adventist church, there can be a multitude of views. But in Christianity in general, you have some people that believe in the moderate use of alcohol. So you have like the Roman Catholics, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, even the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they believe that according to the Bible, alcohol is good and it has its rightful place in the Eucharist and for making the mar heart merry. And then we have those that believe in being abstinent. Many Baptists, many Methodists, Pentecostals, and other evangelical Protestants believe in this, and they believe that although alcohol consumption is not inherently sinful, it's generally not the wisest of choices, so you should abstain from it. So you have the first view that says it's good, it's to make your heart happy, drink within reason. The second view says even though scripture doesn't say it's wrong, you probably shouldn't drink. And then the third view believes in totally prohibiting it from the Christian life. And some, it should be most Seventh-day Adventists, but there are still Adventists that, you know, support the drinking of alcohol and who would like to bring it back into the communion service. But as an Adventist church, when we take our baptismal vows, we literally vow to abstain from alcohol and drugs and other stimulants. There's actually some Methodists who also believe in completely prohibiting alcohol in the church and certain Lutherans, generally those from Finland tend to be a bit more conservative. Um, Finnish Lutherans were really behind the prohibition movement and Mormons. Some people consider them Christians. I, I personally don't because they don't believe in the divinity of Christ, but Mormons in general have a lot of wonderful qualities about their family nature and about their traditional values. And one of them is that they believe in a complete prohibition of alcohol within their church. Adventists fall under this category and Adventists believe that the word wine in the Bible can refer to fermented or unfermented grape juice. And this is backed up by history and also by any concordance that you get. Nowadays, when we say wine, we think of alcohol. But for thousands of years, wine was basically any fruit of the grape. So it could be fresh grape juice, but it also could be fermented. 
And if you look at the context, we can kind of see what kind of wine God is talking about. If he's talking negatively about it, it's probably the fermented grape juice. But if he's talking positively about it and telling people to drink it, most likely it's the fresh grape juice. So this is a very, very famous poem that kind of reminds people about the reality of alcohol. We drank for happiness and became unhappy. We drank for joy and became miserable. We drank for sociability and became argumentative. We drank for sophistication and became obnoxious. We drank for friendship and we made enemies. We drank for sleep and awakened without rest. We drank for strength and felt weak. We drank medicinally and acquired health problems. We drank for relaxation and got the shakes. We drank for bravery and became afraid. We drank for confidence and became doubtful. We drank to make conversation easier and slurred our speech. We drank to forget and were forever haunted. We drank to feel heavenly and ended up feeling like hell. We drank for freedom and became slaves. We drank to erase our problems and saw them multiply. We drank to cope with life and invited death. Mm. So now we're going to see what does the Bible say about alcohol and what about those verses that supposedly tell us drinking is okay. So there's three verses on alcohol on the screen. Maybe if three people can read these verses and then we'll talk about them. Isaiah 5.11, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may pursue strong drink, who stay up late in the evening that wine may inflame them. 1 Peter 4.3, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what? pagans choose to do, mm. living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Mm. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So there's a lot of other verses on alcohol, but we're just focused on these three. Um, what is God telling us about alcohol? What stands out to you? Well, in my verse, it's, it says uh, that you, you shouldn't drink in the morning or in the evening. So I guess you shouldn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> I never noticed that. That's actually a really good point. That's a literal <laughs> reading of the text. <laughs> I think mostly what it means is going to ruin your life. Amen. Uh, my husband says that um, the most domestic abuses actually happen under the influence of alcohol. So when you yeah. think about like, if we just reduced alcohol, not even eliminated it, but just reduced it in our country, like how many people would cease to be a victim of domestic abuse? And a lot of times I was listening to a sermon by Eric Walsh and he used to work with like inner city kids who would participate in drive by shootings. And he would ask them like, how can you do that? Like knowing that you might kill an innocent mother or an innocent child. And what they said, they said a blunt and a 40, you would have some beer and you have some marijuana and two of them together would just like blunt your frontal lobe so that you could do whatever you were told. And mm. yes, they were honest with him, but it was also still very shocking because even young inner city kids realize that alcohol blunts your thinking. Mm. If we look at alcohol in the Bible, some people say, oh, there's a lot of positive examples. Look at what happened to Noah. He gets off the ark. God manifests himself to him in a beautiful way, gives him a rainbow. Then he builds a vineyard, gets drunk, and then he gets naked. And I oftentimes wondered, like, why did God curse the son just for making fun of his dad naked? Like, to me, like, I mean, most people have made fun of someone when they were drunk. Like, it's a bad thing to do. But like, is it really that horrible? But if you look at the context of it, it was actually a lot deeper. He did some pretty profane things to his father as a result of what they had learned prior to the flood. That just showed how evil the people were. And even after the flood, those evil things were still being perpetuated. And that's why God so strongly cursed Canaan, Ham, and their descendants. Mm. So sometimes people use that as like a positive example, like, oh, Noah got drunk. But if you follow out the rest of the story, it didn't end so positively. And if you look at the context, go to different Jewish sources or Bible commentary, even Ellen White describes this unnatural crime. It's a pretty natural crime to make fun of someone when they're drunk. But a natural crime, we could kind of read between the lines. And if we look at other sources, we can see that him getting drunk did not end well. 
If we look at Lot, look at what his daughters did to him. And that was after he got drunk. He would have never allowed that to happen to him if he didn't get drunk. And then if we look at Nadab and Abihu, the Bible doesn't say that they got drunk. But if you look at a few verses later, God prohibits strong drink in the tabernacle. Ellen White says they got drunk before they served in the tabernacle and they were profanely swinging those like little things of incense and they were making jest of it. They were joking around and that's why they were struck dead because they were drunk in the presence of God. And in mm. the Bible, if you go to that story, just a few verses later, it says strong drink is prohibited. Famously in 1 Corinthians and Galatians, it says drunkards will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, if we repent of our ways, most people have been drunk at some point. So it doesn't mean you're permanently banned from heaven, but it means we must repent of our ways. So there's a few other verses. Proverbs says, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler. Whoever's led astray by them is not wise. Proverbs 23 says, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaining, who has wounds without cause, who has red eyes. Those who tarry long over wine, those that try mixed wine. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it's in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent, stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange women. Your heart will utter perverse things. Strange and I know women. when I was young, it was like popular to brag about how much you could drink. It's like you wanted to have this high tolerance. But look at what Isaiah says. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. There is nothing <laughs> to brag about there. And my last comment here before we open it up for discussion is I know I don't reference Ellen White a lot because technically it's a Bible study, but I do believe she's a prophet of God. And this is what she actually says about the origin and invention of alcohol. In her book, Temperance, page 12, this is what she has to say. Satan gathered the fallen angels together to devise some way of doing the most possible evil to the human family. One preposition after another was made till finally Satan himself thought of a plan. He would take the fruit of the vine, also wheat, and other things given by God as food, and would convert them into poisons, which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers, and so overcome the senses that Satan should have full control. Under the influence of liquor, men would be led to commit crimes of all kinds. Through perverted appetite, the world would be made corrupt. By leading men to drink alcohol, Satan would cause them to descend lower and lower in the scale. Amen. So what stands out to you about either these Bible stories or these Bible verses? I know sometimes people think the Bible talks favorably about alcohol, uh, but what do these verses say to you? Not in our best interest to imbibe. Right. Well, it compromises your brain. And anything that compromises your brain affects your relationship with the Lord. So consequently... We've got a lot of stuff. Alcohol is just one of the thousand things that we need to avoid. Right. And by God's grace, he will give us that strength to do his will mm -hmm. and not our own. Amen. Amen, Martha. I know I was just talking to my husband about this, and he actually is joining right now. Um, but as we know, 0 0.08 is considered the legal limit for alcohol. And I was asking him, how many drinks is that? And he said, well, it depends whether it's wine or beer or hard drinks. But regardless, if society's standard is 0 0.08, God's standard is actually much higher than that. So we shouldn't try to get as far away from the standard as possible. We should actually try to grow as near to the standard as possible. Hmm. We're going to now look at some of these Bible verses, four of them in particular, that people use to justify the drinking of alcohol. And I get it. If alcohol is a temptation, of course, you want to think that the Bible says it's okay. Like, we're all like that. There's certain things I like that I would like to think that are okay, but that are not. So that's why we need to just look at these verses, the context that they're written in, so that we can better understand them for ourselves, but also to explain them to someone if they are trying to tell us that scripture supports alcohol. So if someone would be willing to read Deuteronomy 14.23, excuse me, Deuteronomy 14.26, then I'll share a few comments, and then we have two questions at the bottom. So Deuteronomy 14, verse 26, if you don't mind. Deuteronomy 14.26, and thou shalt bestow that money for whatever thy soul lustest after. I love this verse. For oxen, or for sheep. Or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatever thy soul de desireth. 
and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. Amen. This is actually a beautiful verse that's taken I out of context. It. But like, imagine you're at the house of God. Um, there was only one temple back then, and you would come to the temple at least once a year. And a lot of times you were supposed to bring offerings or first fruits. But if you had to travel a long ways, you couldn't bring that. So you would actually sell it to get money. And then once you came to the temple, you would convert that money into whatever you wanted, whether it was oxen or sheep or strong drink. And then you would give it as an offering to God. And a lot of people say, oh, well, God is telling you it's okay to be drunk. Like as long as your heart wants it and you're praising him, it's totally okay to have wine or strong drink. But verse 22 and verse 27 shed more light on what this verse means. So if someone would be willing to read Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 and 27. 22. I'll read it. Note that context is key. Taken from answers to difficult Bible texts by Joe Crew. Read verse 22 and 27 to shed more light on the verse, on this verse refers to a second tithe. Drink was to be poured on the ground. Remember <laughs> that God is talking to faithful people who are tithing. He assumes that they are not going to desire evil things as an offering to him. Amen. Thank you. So yeah, if you check out the whole chapter later, it's always good to read the whole chapter instead of just like one verse. Because if we read one verse, it makes it look like, okay, I could get drunk. My heart desires this. God is fine with this. But if we read the whole chapter, we'll see that he was talking to faithful people. They were tithing and they were actually paying a second tithe. And so obviously, if you're that dedicated to God, you are not going to lust after things that you know are blasphemous or that you know are prohibited by him. And it's also very interesting to note later on, if you read it, it says that the strong drink or wine would be poured out on the ground. So that would be like the equivalent of buying a really fancy bottle of wine. And instead of drinking it, you pour it out on the ground as an offering to God. So it's kind mm -hmm. of showing God that he is most important. So two questions at the bottom is, what is this verse talking about? And why is it important? Why is it important? Or why is it important to understand the biblical and cultural context? So what is the verse talking about? And why does it kind of help to know the context when we see a verse like this well when i read this i was still a drunk mm -hmm. and uh i was having a hard time quitting i really liked being drunk because i was so miserable feeling sorry for myself and when i read that i said aha this is what i desire now truly i I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that part it out on the ground part. <laughs> so it's been a battle, you know, but I know that God can change lives and he can change my heart and he has changed my heart. Uh, but there are weak moments in my life. You know what I mean? So I just want you to know that. You know, I get get together with a bunch of people that, that do stuff and I might say stuff that I shouldn't say or I eat things that I shouldn't eat. And uh, by God's grace, I can refrain from doing things that are not right, you know, in God's eyes. Because when, you know, when we hang around with each other like this, we don't think that we sh should go out there and, and take a, a blunt. Well, that that's actually a... A, a marijuana cigarette or or alcohol or a 40 which is which is a 40 ounces of beer it's funny that i know that stuff isn't it <laughs> <laughs> but anyway i just want you to know by god's grace we are righteous in his eyes he looks at us as holy righteous and good you don't you know when you're doing that stuff yeah you're in the beginning you're saying it's okay but after you do it, you go, oh, that was stupid. I got a headache. I don't feel good. I don't know what's going to happen today. Can I make it? Anyway, by God's grace, we can all be pure and holy. That's my lecture. Mark, <laughs> yeah. Mark, I know those things too for a different reason. <laughs> Jeff is on the other side. <laughs> <laughs>
Amen. I find it just beautiful that like when you know the context to something, all of a sudden it makes so much more sense because I could definitely see myself using this verse as like a justification. You know, Mark said he was able to see in this verse, oh, it's okay to drink. But if you read the rest of the chapter and even the rest of the surrounding chapters, it sheds a lot of light on what God was asking. God was asking for something valuable to show him that you really loved him that you really valued his protection so that's why people whatever they lusted after oxen sheep wine strong drink whatever was valuable in their eyes they bought it and then they offered it as a sacrifice to god and some of the things they were allowed to eat but other things like the alcohol they poured out on the ground as an offering to god amen now this is another verse that oftentimes i thought this referred to giving people alcohol that it was okay to do so Proverbs 31, 6. So if someone would please read that verse, and then after they read that verse, I'm going to make a few comments, and then we actually have two questions on the bottom. So Proverbs 31, 6, if you don't mind. Yeah, I know this one very good. This was a good one for me. Give strong that is ready to perish. That's how I feel, Lord. I'm ready to perish. And wine unto those who have heavy hearts. Oh, I'm so sad. I can justify anything. <laughs> and at Forgive first, me. it does look like I'm sad. I'm depressed. I had a horrible day. You know, I'm suffering grief. Like, it's okay for me to drink. But if we go to Proverbs 31 and read verses 1 to 5, we can see that's not the context at all. So if someone would be willing to open their Bibles to Proverbs chapter 31, and if you could read verses 1 to 5, that will actually shed some light on this verse. They stole Proverbs from me. I got it. Oh, you got it. Good. Sayings of King um, Lemuel. Lemuel. In inspired utterance, his mother taught him. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, <laughs> my son, and answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who <laughs> ruin kings. It is not for kings, Lemuel. Uh, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget that uh, has been, excuse me, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Just a reminder from our Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank if you, you read those much. first five verses, it's actually saying a normal person should not drink alcohol. Alcohol is going to ruin you. So why would God spend five verses condemning alcohol? And then all of a sudden in verse six, say, it's okay, go out and get drunk and tell other people to get drunk too. He won't. Yeah. So if you we read the whole thing in context, he's actually condemning alcohol, saying responsible people should not drink, but if it's like a life altering emergency, if someone is in chronic pain about to die, it may be permissible, kind of like a narcotic. Because yeah. remember, Jesus was on the cross, they gave him some strong drink mixed with herbs, yeah. he refused it. But there's some Adventists that believe that, like, if you're in the hospital, you should refuse all narcotics because technically they're a drug. But I had brain surgery, I know how painful that can be. I believe that narcotics can be used under a doctor's supervision in life changing or life or death situations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, anesthesia is some sort of drug, like it kind of puts you under, like sometimes these drugs are necessary, but just like in verse six, they should only be used in life or death situations. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, what do you think this verse means? And what are your thoughts on like the Christian and the use of narcotics? Well, Ashley, this is Lisa. I don't know. You probably can't see me, but I think for someone who is dying as a painkiller, I think alcohol might be useful um, because some of the narcotics may not agree with somebody where maybe they can take some alcohol and sort of ease their discomfort. Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, that's the whole point of dying. alcohol. The whole point of alcohol is to go away, L relieve your thinking. But yeah. if your heart is always on the Lord, now I'm going to say this, this is careful. I'm trying to be careful with this. If your heart is always on the Lord and you're trusting in him, it doesn't matter what happens to you because he can, he can take care of you 
through all that hell that you're going through, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, yeah. I had a son, of course, he, he died that way. So I, he was in pain all the time, all the time. And yeah. I, I watched him, you know, for the 10 years that he was with me. And it was just, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm going to have to just agree with, with Lisa. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, yeah, if, if you, in, in certain emergency situations, but to live that way, uh, you just, you're just, you're just hurting yourself, yeah. but yeah. you're, 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 you're making God look like an idiot. You know, you're called yourself a Christian and this is what you do. This is not right. You know, it's like lusting after women, you know? Yeah. They're, they're pretty and everything, but you shouldn't be lusting after them. You can appreciate their beauty, just like flowers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just. Yeah. I agree yeah. with bo both of you. Like, does anyone have any thoughts on that, that they would like to share? In nursing homes, uh, they often give patients a small amount of alcohol uh, to increase their appetite. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, sometimes I do that. Never had the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Can it have the opposite impact? impact? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> So this this, a, oh no! What were you saying, Mark? These are these are not not to condemn people. Okay, right. this is this is to encourage people. Okay, the Bible is a great encourager of of life, mm -hmm. and so don't look at it as condemnation. Because Romans eight one, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Read this as it's supposed to be read. Just what we're doing, we're learning about it. We're making sure that we don't make mistakes and calling people idiots for drinking. Right. Yes, they probably are, but let's not call them that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was perfect. Like, I'll say it again, just because it was so good. My husband read that chapter on repentance from Steps to Christ. And it says, we call out people for the sin of drunkenness, but not for pride. And that's actually <laughs> so much more serious in the eyes of God. So, yeah. so I agree, like these, um, this topic is not done like in to cast judgment on anyone, because even in the church, people do struggle with alcohol. So it's not meant to cast judgment. I think people realize innately that alcohol consumption is wrong, that it's not something the Lord desires, but their heart desires it. And sometimes it's easy to use these verses to justify the drinking of alcohol. So that's why we're going through these verses. But I love Ezekiel. I think it's 36, 26. A new heart yeah. also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. If Amen. your heart desires alcohol, the Lord can easily take away that desire. Yeah. If you want it to be taken away. Yes, if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. th this one all the time is misinterpreted. And a lot of people use Jesus's first miracle at Cana turning the water into wine as justification for why wine is a beautiful thing and why there's no condemnation in drinking. So we won't read the whole miracle because I, I feel like we're very familiar with it. It's 11 verses long, but you can see from the verses on the screen, it talks about when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made into wine, a few verses down, he says, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have drunk, then he gives that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. So Jesus kept the best for last. And some people will say, oh, well, that's alcohol. He kept the best wine for last. But like what we talked about for thousands of years in the Hebrew, there was no differentiation. The same word for wine could refer to fermented or unfermented. And Jesus was the same author of the Old Testament as he was of the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, he oftentimes condemned alcohol, particularly in Proverbs and Isaiah. In the New Testament, he said drunkards won't go to heaven. So why would he create alcohol if he condemned it in the Old Testament and said you can't be a drunk and go to heaven in the New Testament? So it's important to remember that the word for wine can mean both fermented or unfermented, as we can see from the screen right here. So you can see that there's three words that are used for wine in the Bible. I don't know how to pronounce them in Hebrew, but the first one, yahin, is wine. It's either fermented or unfermented. So that's where people get a lot of confusion mm. over that. Then there's tarash, which is must or fresh grape juice. Rarely is it fermented. 
And then shakar is a sweet drink expressed from fruits other than the grape, and it's drunk in an unfermented or fermented state. So all three of those could actually be referring to wine, but we don't know if it's fermented or unfermented unless we read the context. And if we follow out the rest of the parable or the rest of the miracle here, we can actually see at the end of the wedding, the inhabitants were refreshed. They were not drunk. They were refreshed. Mm. They were Amen. praising the quality. People that got really drunk, they can't taste the quality of cheap wine versus expensive <laughs> wine. But these wedding inhabitants were refreshed. They were praising and they were thanking Jesus. Amen. And Ellen White has a comment in Desire of Ages on her chapter on this. And she says, it just represents Christ. His gifts are ever fresh and new. He saves the best for last. So mm -hmm. your relationship with Jesus will only get better and better if you're faithful. And he has even better and better things in store for you, just like he saved the best wine for last. You know, also Ellen White says, uh, fermented wine or alcohol never passed the savior's lips i don't know where that is but it's it's a uh, ellen white says <laughs> it's, in the same, it's in the same chapter it's in desire of ages and it's in the chapter on the wedding of cana so okay. that, i'm so glad you brought that up <laughs> okay so this is probably the most common out of the misunderstood bible verses all the time people use this to support the drinking of wine or other type of alcohol so how could you respond when this passage is used to support the drinking of alcohol? To support it? Well, how could you respond? If someone is using this verse to support alcohol, um, how could you explain this verse, the history behind it? Well, I was going through this the other day because I was watching it, you know, on uh, The Chosen. And uh, they didn't differentiate it. But in my mind, you know, and you said it already. If you taste it um, and you can taste something, you have a a, a good, uh, what is it, a sensation, a good taste. But if you, wine numbs everything, alcohol numbs everything. So you cannot tell whether it's good or bad anymore. You have to have it fresh. And I just looked it up on ChatGPT. It takes uh, uh, one or two weeks for it to ferment. And Jesus just made that, and it was not fermented. <laughs> and the last Bible verse here is commonly misinterpreted as well, and it's from 1 Timothy 5.23. And Paul is telling Timothy, who was like a son to him, he was telling him these words. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. So Timothy was suffering from stomach ailments and Paul is saying, hey, don't drink so much water, but use a little wine that will help you. And a lot of people jump on this and they're like, that's it. Even the Bible says a little bit of wine every day is good for you. But we've got to look at the context. If it really was alcohol, that would be the dumbest thing to put inside your stomach. Alcohol literally tears away at your stomach. If you go to drinkaware.com, they have so many health studies that back this up. And when you drink alcohol, it actually has a range of effects on your stomach and your whole digestive system. And in simple, real terms, it actually disrupts your gut, including your stomach. It can cause heartburn, that acid can rise up. It can even develop painful ulcers in your stomach lining. From the National Library of Science, it says alcohol interferes with the structure as well as the function of GI tract segments. And then it goes into all the science of what it does to your digestive system, what it does to your stomach. So obviously, God, who is telling Paul to write this, is not going to tell Timothy to put alcohol into his stomach, which is just going to further disrupt his stomach. Most likely, and I firmly believe it actually referred to unfermented grape juice, because look at even doctors, holistic doctors recommend this today. If you are having stomach pain or digestive issues, go on a grape juice fast. Mm. One part or more of freshly juiced conquered or red grapes, seeds, small stems as well, the darker, the better. Whenever you eat fruits or vegetables, the darker, the better. Go for those dark greens, go for those dark potatoes, those dark carrots. Everything that's darker <laughs> is generally better. And then you can use a juice extractor or a juicer, juice any quantity of grapes desired, store in a glass mason jar or an airtight container. And then this is how you take that fast. You drink the grape juice as often as much as you want. To fast properly, drink only grape juice and no other foods or drinks. 
This fast could be done for 24 hours or up to 60 days or more. Grapes are high in antioxidants and astringent properties. This makes for an excellent fast because of its lymphatic cleansing abilities. Amen. So knowing the science behind this, to me, it makes perfect sense that the Apostle Paul was recommending taking some fresh grape juice. He certainly was not telling him to put alcohol in his stomach if he was having stomach issues. Wow. For a person that is a diabetic, uh, it's not a good idea to drink a whole lot of grape, fresh grape juice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's uh, because sugar. it's got a lot of sugar in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of sugar in it. Yeah, it's interesting in the ancient world, um, diabetes wasn't even an issue. I, mm -hmm. I think like diabetes has evolved throughout the years. A lot of it, um, some of it might be genetic. A lot of it is most likely our diet and what we're consuming. Um, but it's interesting that in the ancient world, diabetes wasn't even an issue. So I totally agree with Elaine. Like if you're diabetic, do your research. You probably shouldn't be putting all that sugar in your body. But if you're not <laughs> diabetic and you want to cleanse the body, particularly the stomach, maybe do a grape juice fast. Most likely that's why Paul told Timothy to do it because he was able to detox his system while still getting some of the energy that he needed. So just a second, let me grab the squeaky toys that are in the background. <laughs> Sorry, this Mr. Monkey, he only comes out at Bible study time when Brutus feels the need to. <laughs> so the two questions here are, how does alcohol, including wine, affect stomach? And question number two, would Paul, who was inspired by God, really tell Timothy to drink fermented wine to help his stomach? So what are your thoughts on this? Well, you've already read that it's not good for us. <laughs> It's not good for your digestion. It's not good for ulcers. It's not good for anything. So Paul wouldn't mm -hmm. Paul wouldn't tell us to drink that. No, not fermented anyway. Right. You no. Know, unless you made a mistake and waited three years. <laughs> I made one time I I bought some uh, apple cider and I wondered what would happen if I put it in the closet for a couple of weeks. And guess what? It Blew got up. fermented. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, I was about 16. No, it didn't blow up because it was a glass. Anyway, didn't taste that good, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Sure. Of course. App apple cider vinegar, is that considered a, a bad drink to put some in your water? Well, no, because it's it's got it's got a a property that is beneficial for digestion and uh, to to awaken you. Let me see apple cider vinegar. I just saw that on on a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm not an expert at it, but it it, it when I remember to take a, a shot of that stuff mm -hmm. or an ounce, uh, I feel better. I I just feel better. I did too. I put a capful in a glass of water, mm -hmm. about an eight ounce glass of water, and it actually seemed to help my stomach. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, since I was having stomach aches, I tried that too. But isn't that, it works. Fermented, isn't that fermented? Wow. But it's, it goes to the next stage. It's past fermentation. Oh, okay. Well, wait a minute. I, I well, don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's, it's beneficial. Some, some things are beneficial that way. Well, I'll, I'll just quickly share like my history with that. Um, alcohol, al alcohol is obviously prohibited by scripture and by Ellen White. She writes a lot about this in councils on diet and foods and ministry of healing. And she also talks a lot about vinegar. She had a major struggle with vinegar and it took her a while to get over that. But then she was able <laughs> to get rid of vinegar and she used lemon juice instead. Mm. So several years ago, when I was watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians, which you should not be watching, I should not have been watching it. They were losing weight by drinking apple cider vinegar, like, you know, like a capful before they ate. So I'm like, oh, it worked for them. Let me try it. Of course, it didn't work. I stayed the same. So, but later I started, as I got a little bit more sanctified and stopped watching stuff like that and reading more Ellen White, I wondered, like, is apple cider vinegar in the same category? You know, there's two camps within Adventism. I know a lot of Adventists that actually have apple cider vinegar and they say it helps them. It helps with their gut bacteria and their gut health. <laughs> and a lot of people I really respect actually have apple cider vinegar a little bit every day. There's other people like Barbara O'Neill. She's like a health reformer. Yeah. Uh, she travels yeah. all over the world. 
if you look up her and apple cider vinegar, she says it's one step away from alcohol. And she said it actually irritates the gut and to stay away from it. So I'm only sharing that because I'm not an expert, but I've done a little bit of research on it. And it looks like within the Adventist church, there's a lot of people that swear by its merits, but then there's other people that say stay away from it. So okay. I would say probably just look it up and see what other people have to say because yeah. um, I don't take it anymore and I haven't noticed a difference taking it or not taking it, but I'm definitely not knowledgeable enough to tell anyone else that. Okay, thank you. Does anybody uh, else have any, like, does anybody else use apple cider vinegar or have any thoughts on that? Yes, indeed. Okay. Yeah. Um. I use, uh, if I'm doing it right, I do what Craig taught us, which is the apple cider vinegar in the morning, uh, nothing to eat, and then go out for 30 minutes or 40 minutes of exercise and then come in and eat a breakfast. Okay. Okay. Did you see a benefit from that? Yes. I lost weight and my immune potential increased exponentially. Oh, okay. Very good. Yeah. Amen. You see, when we say one step away, you know, how many steps away is it from the grape? Okay. The grape is the first and then the juice. That's another step. That's, that's a different step. You see what I'm doing? I'm just messing yeah. with y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just remember it was like a YouTube short. It was like Barbara <laughs> O'Neill and apple cider vinegar. So I clicked on it and that's what stood out to me. But I obviously don't know a lot about it. I was only sharing what I came across. You, you I'm going to look it own. up. Right, so I'll help you. Do you all make your own or do you use the Braggs? I use you can, Braggs. You can get it in gallon jugs. It's much cheaper. Really? Oh. Hmm. Where do you buy it in a gallon jug? There's a mixture that you do, and I'll have to look it up on Craig's website, but you do apple cider vinegar and lemon juice and it ends up with a alkaline pH, I think, which is important. Yeah. Um, and I forget the rest of it. But uh, then you go out and you exercise and uh, drink lots of water. Okay. Hopefully there's a bathroom somewhere near Ron, but, you know, that's the secondary yeah. question. You can purchase it on Amazon. It can be used also uh, for washing your hair yes yes you, you rinse with it yeah i rinse with it i didn't know that very interesting it cleans a scalp if you have curly or coarse hair sometimes it's hard for those oils to move away from the scalp and down the hair shaft and the vinegar kind of cuts through that scalp uh gunk it's a stripper yeah it strips the scalp of gunk and they say it's a, a natural stripper. Now, I don't know, you know. No, leave it. And, and while we're on the subject, so let's not forget the season of the witch. You Otherwise, know, it's just uh, witch hazel. But I did you know, in the preparatory point. I'm going to reach a fortnight or yet. Hmm. Does, does anyone use uh, witch hazel? Yes. I used to as an astringent on my skin. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Well, here it says in chat, I'm gonna only show I'm gonna only read the stuff that it says that, that it it can cause harm. Tooth enamel, uh erosion, digestive issues may cause uh digestive discomfort or worsen condition like acid reflux when consumed in large amounts. The key is always just keep it in small amounts. Interaction yeah. with medicines, uh apple cider vinegar might interfere with certain medications, especially for diabetes or heart condition. Mm. So it had the same stuff have... that we've been talking about that it's good for you in certain instances. Usually it's it's small amounts and because of the, the problem we have of, of controlling our appetites and our, our lust, we, we don't take just a little bit. We overdo. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just talking it, about it, myself. It, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I'm talking about myself too. If some is better, a lot more is even better. No, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I feel. with your doctor if there's any <laughs> questions. Well, I, I get different doctors have different understandings of stuff. So I, I yeah. asked the doctor I, that I want to hear what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> those are great doctors. I love those guys. <laughs> and usually they walk away with an education they didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. If that's what you're looking for. <laughs> Well, as you can see, this is only a scratch on the surface. So I, I think as Adventists, we're very familiar with the topic of alcohol because we literally took a baptismal vow to abstain from it. And, you know, many people have made mistakes. We've all broken our baptismal vows. So this is not meant to cast judgment on anyone. You know, the Lord will graciously, I like that verse. He says he will like redeem the crops or redeem the years that the locusts have stolen or eaten. Like God can turn all things for our own good. And even mm -hmm. our mistakes can actually be used to draw us closer to God. Mm -hmm. So tonight, hopefully, we'll just be better prepared if someone asks us, like, why don't you drink? Or doesn't the Bible say it's okay to drink? Now we know that it's always helpful to read the verses before and to read the verses afterwards. It also helps to know a little bit of Hebrew. I don't know Hebrew, but we all have a computer. We can easily Google it, and we can see <laughs> that wine can be fermented or unfermented. Amen. And it's also dangerous to use the words alcohol and baptismal in the same paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. That's funny. So next week, if you're interested in coming out, um, we're going to look at the various views on hell. What's the history of hell? Um, what have famous groups or famous cultures taught on hell? And how come there are so many divergent views within Christianity? Because the Bible only teaches one view of hell. And we don't claim to have that one view, but the Bible can certainly interpret it itself so that we can see what the Bible truly has to say about hell. Amen. So thank, thank you. you very much for coming out. Thank you for sharing. If there's any, you guys mentioned a lot of like holistic techniques and things that you personally do. If you want to email it to me, I'll definitely email it out to the group because and we certainly would love to learn a lot more. Check Craig's website, Love and Live the World, Word, Love and Live the Word. He okay. has he has put out formulas for pretty much everything that he's done out there. Okay. Uh, if, if that's the wrong one, I'll put it out uh, and send it to you an email, and you can digest what you wish of it. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dan. Amen. Good. Sorry, we have a lot of distraction, but they are cute distractions, as you can see. <laughs> we have the big nugget and then the little nugget on the floor. The little one is the boss right there. Interestingly yeah. enough, here in Brookline, oh. the owners of the dogs get a little upset when they uh, uh, come to me more than they do their owners. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I get yeah. down on the ground and, and, and lay under their throat and then they, they lick me and say, can I go home with you? Okay. <laughs> if they're pocket sized, I almost try it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, this okay. one, this lion here, you can see his canine teeth there. He's a big dog, but he's a gentle giant. <laughs> oh. Good old dog. The, the, um, the therapy dog at Brookline Police is a... Uh, a uh, great big uh, golden lab named Bear. And he's the only one with a CID badge that can go backstage. And I asked if we could follow him. And he said, and the lady goes, only if you want to end up in the cell. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> That's good. good. Well, thank you for coming out. And Mark, thank you for starting mm -hmm. us with prayer. And um, Don, do you mind closing us with prayer? No. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another precious day with our Bible study group here, and we we certainly do learn. I know, Father, that um, I have uh, not been very much into alcohol. My father is not into it, and I uh, kind of followed him most of my life. The only time Amen. my father ever had a drink, Father, was when <laughs> uh, I came home from service uh, and uh, he had a drink because I was safe. I, I, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you do for us and all that you uh, uh, have us do to follow you. 
in the scripture that uh, gives us all the things that you would have us do. And we thank you with all of our hearts. And we Amen. Uh, say this in the name, the precious name of the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.